So this Shi'ur is in memory of Miriam Bat Biba, uh, the mother of Ami Malka, and it's sponsored by uh, Ruth Bisson and Shimon Ozil. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Thank you. We... For the next four weeks, and including the parasha that we just read, it's all talking about the Mishkan. Okay. Parasha Kitisa, a little bit the Mishkan, but all of parasha Teuma, all of parasha Tisave, all of parasha Vayakhel, and all of parasha Pikude is all talking about the building of the Mishkan, the sanctuary. Now I understand the importance of the Mishkan. Why does it have to be at the end of the book of Shemot? And also, why is it so important that it has to be discussed at such length? Why is it so central? Why is the Mishkan... What is it? It's, it's as my children would say. My, my daughter, my, my, my two-year-old daughter came home. And, and we asked her, so what did you learn? She said, we learned in the parsha that Hashem made a big shul. A big shul. Right? That's what the Mishkat, a big shul, a big Bet Knesset. So the Ramban, the Ramban, he says in his introduction to the book of Shemot, that the Mishkan wasn't merely a place where we could we were meet Palel. The Ramban says like this, Sefer Bereshit, the book of Bereshit, is the blueprint on what's going to happen to the Jewish people. Shemot is implementing that blueprint, is implementing the plan. So how do we implement it? How do we implement it? The Jews had to go through their birth stage of going through Egypt, uh, until they were nechshevu kegeulim, he writes, like they were considered actually delivered from Hashem. And says the Ramban, the, the Ramban, they are not considered fully delivered and fully a nation until they they got the Torah and they built the Mishkan. That's what the Ramban said. That we didn't reach our pinnacle, we didn't reach our level. We didn't reach our ultimate destiny until the Mishkan was built. That's what the Ramban writes. Until the Mishkan was built, we didn't reach our ultimate destiny. Now, why is that? Why didn't we reach our ultimate destiny? What, what happened in the Mishkan that we finally we reached our ultimate destiny? So, so, so what happened to us was like this. The Shekhinah came down, right. It says in the Pasuk, once you do a Mishkan, make for me a sanctuary and I will rest upon you. So the Midrash tells us, very interesting, that it used to be that when Hashem created the world with Adam HaRishon, the Shekhinah was rested in this world by everyone. Then it says, one generation after the next, Adam sinned, so the Shekhinah went up a sky, to the first sky. There were seven skies. And then when Cain sinned, he went up to the next. Then Dor Enosh, the third. Dor, Hafla, Dor Hamabul, again. Dor Haflaga, again. Until it reached to the time of Sedom, again. The time of Avram's Paro, I'm sorry. The time of, 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 of Paro, in the time of Avram Avinu, you know, there was a Paro in the time of Avram Avinu, where uh, Avram hid Sarah from, again, until it reached Sedom, the Shekhinah started by Adam Arishon, and by the time it reached Avram Avinu, it was all the way up in the seventh sky. That's it. We messed up. We messed up. The mankind messed up, and the Shekhinah didn't want to rest in this world. It used to be that the that, 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 that you could say that the presence of Hashem was, was part of this world, that you could see Hashem. And that's it, we lost it. What did Hashem do? He planted seven tzaddikim in the world 
to bring down the Shekhinah from the seven skies till, till this world. Who are, the, who are the seven Sadiqim? It started from Abraham. Then it went to Yitzhak. Then it went to Yaakov. Then it went to Levi, the son of Yaakov, the Midrash says. From Levi, it went to Tekehat, also from the children, uh, also from the uh, Levi tribe. From Kehat, it went to Amram, the father of Moshe Rabbeinu. From Amram, it went down to Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu was able to take the Shekhinah and bring it down to the earth. That's why he went to get the Torah. And he was able to bring the Shekhinah back to the earth. When he did that, the Mishkan was built so that we could bring the Shekhinah in the Mishkan. So it turns out that bringing the, Mish- bringing the Shekhinah in this world is not merely a nice thing that we build a big bit Knesset. It was the purpose of the world that when Hashem made the world, the Shekhinah used to be by Adam Arishon. And then it got lost. And we had to bring it back down. And when we built the Beta Mishkat, Beta HaMikdash, we were able to bring the Shekhinah back down. We had the Beta Mikdash, and eventually it got destroyed. And now we are in a stage for many, many years, hundreds of years, without the Shekhinah. But that's the ultimate purpose, that we should have Hashem's presence resting among us. That's what, that's what, the, that's what really the, 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 the goal, the end result, that we should have Hashem with us. Now, even though we don't have the Mishkan, we have to understand that our bodies are a miniature Mishkan. Our bodies are a miniature Mishkan. Each and every one of our bodies are a miniature Mishkan. And we have our soul is the Arona Kodesh. Our, our heart, our heart has where the soul rests. And, and, the, and we're very, we have a special power in us that we're like a miniature Mishkan. That's why when we give somebody a Biracha, We'll say, oh, why should I give you a bracha? Who am I? People ask me bracha. So, eh, what, what am I going to give you a bracha? Who am I? It's to understand that every person in Am Yisrael is a mishkan. Every person in Am Yisrael has the shekhinah that rests in them. We don't have it collectively anymore in the earth, but we still have the shekhinah in us. And that's why we have to be... So, this is the subject that I wanted to speak about today. How do we how do we conduct our lives in a way that we keep our mishkan, our bodies pure? Because there is so much distractions on the outside world. We tell ourselves, "Me, I am holy." No, that's that's for that's for Baba Saleh and that's for Rabbi Chaim Pito. What do I have to do with holiness? It's a big mistake. That's the Yitzhar Hara talking. Each and every one of us has tremendous holiness in us. And our mistake is that we think that since we didn't reach the highest of levels, it's an all or nothing deal. And that's totally false. And that's totally false. And this is what I'm going to prove today, we're going to speak about today, that the purpose of 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 this our challenges in this world is never is never to give up and to keep on you know it says that Hakadosh Baruch Hu leanchil leolamo yesh Hashem gave leanchil he gave yesh world yesh is yud shin shai olamo three hundred and ten worlds Hashem gave us. 300 of them are just to be able to rise all the negative world. It's like the negative world. And the 10 are to rise above levels. What does this mean? This means that even if a person he, he encounters a challenge and he, he fails the challenge once, twice, three times, four times, 50 times, 100 times, but on the 299th time he conquered it, that's already one world he conquered. So you shouldn't think, okay, I didn't get it this time, but if I get it next time, it's also something. We make the mistake of thinking, oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy of this because I never do it. So why, why get into it in the first place? Why should I, uh, why should I try 
uh, uh, conquering my anger. I get angry every time. Even one time that I conquer my anger out of 10 times, out of 20 times, out of 50 times is already something. Our body remains that mishkan, that is 310 worlds that we have to conquer, the 300 negative worlds, and the other 10 worlds we could start rising. But every single world that we conquer is something. Every little world that we conquer, we have, we, we, do, we, we have something positive inside. So I want to tell you like this. I'm going to tell you a formula and a recipe. This was that, that, that not, not a food recipe. No, I'm not, I wouldn't do that in this shi'ur. I know my place. It says, who is a wise man? Exactly. I mean, who is a wise man? One who knows his place. Right? I'm not going to say that. What I do want to say is that I once made eggs, actually. I once made eggs. That I know. <laughs> that, that, the recipe for success in life, Rabbi Pesach Kron said this over, that he's heard this at a fundraising seminar, and he based, uh, and, and, and he based this on one of his talks, and I think it's a very inspiring formula and recipe, which is like this. SW parentheses 3 slash N. That's the recipe. SW parentheses 3 slash N. What does that mean? This person was talking about fundraising, but it applies to all areas of our life. Some will. Some won't. So what? Next. You understand? Let's say in fundraising, a person is collecting for a Torah institution. Some will give. Some will say no. So what? It's okay. Next. But the same thing applies in, 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 in life. A person is trying to get a job. Some will hire you. Some won't. So what? Next. Next. It applies whenever we, 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 we face a challenge in life and we get thrown off course. Some will, some won't, sometimes it'll be good, sometimes not. So what? Next. We have to keep on moving. We can't get stuck in our place. We have to know that life is all about moving. Do you know who I learned this from, especially? From from the from Prime Minister Harper. Oh yeah. Well, Prime Minister Harper, as you all know, visited Israel. He took half of Toronto with him. And he, I don't know. I got I don't know. And oh, you went to see him? Oh, yeah, very good. He, he had Kabbalah Kahan. He had. <laughs> He's a, wow, 4,000 people. 4, people there, look at that. Well, we, he's a tremendous friend of the Jews. And when he, and, and he spoke things in the, in the Israeli parliament, in the Knesset, that nobody had the courage to speak about before. And one of the things that he said was that he, is, he admires the Jewish people because he comes into this land that they have had so much suffering and so much beating and so much persecution. And he, not only but from the Holocaust, you know how persecuted the Jews were in Iran? You know how persecuted in Syria? In Morocco also there was plenty of persecution. Plenty of persecution. And here you have the Jewish people who could have just wallowed in their misery, found some corner in Zimbabwe, and just, that's it, become a very, um, uh, uh, plus, uh, uh, very, very dull nation without energy, you know, enough, we're suffering, let's just be miserable and pessimistic. Why, why, why keep on moving so much? But instead, Israel is thriving. Israel is moving. The Jews are 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 building. You ever go to Israel? It's never the same when you go. You're always building. It's always new stuff you're going. I go when I go visit Montreal. It's the same thing as when I left there. It's always the same. 
Then nothing changed. Yeah, <laughs> Jay's love. It's all the same, and the the, the Mrs. Vuitton knows even let's say Wilderton Shopping Center, right? All the same. The tiles are the same. The paint is the same. Everything is the same. But you go to and it's, it's always moving. And the shoes are always always moving. So uh, Prime Minister Harper said, I am I am I'm admiring the Jewish people. How they didn't just give up and they said, you know what? It's too hard for us. That's it. We're throwing in the towel. And you keep on moving. That was the beginning of his speech. Then he said other things that were like unbelievable. He had the courage to say that anti-Israel nowadays, right, That an, this is when he left, that anti-Israel, anti-Israel means anti-Semitism nowadays. Nobody ever had the, the courage to say that. As an to say that that was that was the first, and he got a big standing ovation for that. Yeah. And of course, the the Arab uh, the Arab Knesset members uh, they 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 barked and they they left. Okay, exactly. And the Knesset, it's a, you know how the Knesset works. It's a common occurrence. Exactly. So some will, some won't. So what next? But I want to tell you another story. Yeah. This is a beautiful and unbelievable story about a person who took this lesson to heart, how the Jewish people, they got hit and they kept on moving. The name of this person is Dr. Bernd Wetscheller. Wetscheller. Schneller. He's German. And he recently revealed his story. Growing up as a child in Germany, he was a very curious boy. A very curious boy. Now he's a doctor who lived in Miami. He was a very curious boy because he knew that his father was a proud veteran from the German uh, army. He wasn't in the SS. He was in the regular German army that there was. But it was never spoken about at home, never at home or at school. We're going to talk about this is the, the 60s, in the 60s, never spoken about in Germany, at home or in school, about the Holocaust, about Jews. Not spoken about at all. They were extremely embarrassed, ashamed, and uh, disgrace, and he wasn't the subject to be brought up at home. As a matter of fact, when he would ask a couple of things, right away the parents would say, we don't talk about that. Said, we go further. But he was a very curious boy, and he wanted to know more. So he, he, he went to school, and they actually the teacher started talking about it a little bit and how they, they killed the Jews. And then he came and says, is it true? They killed Jews. So the father would say, well, in all wars we kill, and that's what happened. But this boy didn't suffice by that. He started looking into things. When he started reading along, he started seeing that there were systematic killings. And they didn't only kill uh, in, in war, fair. They killed women and children. And they started to see what was going on. And he confronted his father. And his father said, well, you have to understand, there was the, we ha it was a matter of survival. This is the Aryan race, the, the, the superior race, only the superior lip. That was Hitler's, that was his philosophy. Yeah. Only the superior race, and whoever's not superior race. When he heard that, he, he couldn't respect his father. That's what he said. He says, I, I, I don't understand. And from that day on, it's like he lost his father. He was a very truthful person. A very truthful person. No, his, father's a, his father was, was part of the war. It, his father got the honor of being a knight's cross. In other words, a special honor from the Fuhrer himself, from Hitler himself. He was in a, in a command and in a battalion. He wasn't part of the SS, but he was right under the Weltschung or something. They, were, they had a name for that army. And here he is, this very curious person. He tells his parents, I must find an answer. And he was a college student in, in medical school. 
and he says, I want to go to Israel to find who these people are and how this works. And he went to approach his father because he needed money to go. So the father said, I know I lost you a long time ago. Go to your mother. She'll give you the money. I can't give you the money. In other words, he gave his mother the, his wife the money that, that, that they should give the child. But he knew that they, they, they were all sad when he left. But he said, don't worry, I'll be back. And he went to Israel. And what did he discover? He discovered a, a, a nation that is not wallowing in their depression and what occurred 20, 30 years ago. They were alive and well, and they were, they were, they were, they were bustling, and they were advancing, and they were continuing their education, and, and he, he never felt like this before. And he went to the Kotel, the Western Wall, the place where all the Jews cry. You know, some, guy, some person once went into a taxi, and he says, bring me to the place where the Jews cry. So he, I told you this, so he went to the tax office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mentioned this before. No, but this one he went. They brought it. The dual tempo. They no, but they didn't. They, they instead they went to. They, they, they brought him to the hotel, and he, he felt such a connection. How people are praying. He really felt a very very big pull, and he didn't know what it was. And the person out of the blue came to him, and says. Where are you from? He says, I'm from Germany. Says, there are not so many German Jews left. Says, I'm not from the Jews. <laughs> so people weren't very uh, uh, welcoming of Germans. Yeah, especially 20 years after the Holocaust. So the, so the, the, the person looks at him. It was a religious Jew. He looks at him. He says, you don't, I don't know why you're here. Maybe you don't know why you're here. But you're here for a reason, and figure it out. And he like, and he leaves this person. And his doctor, he doesn't know what, what's what's going on. He has a great trip. He goes back to Germany, continues his education. But he, his mother grew up as a religious Catholic. The Germans, the the Nazis especially, were totally atheists. But the mother grew up Catholic, and. She and and he he walks into the confession room by the priest. And he tells him, "I'm leaving the Catholic religion. I don't see any anything to do. You know, I I don't understand it. My intention is on being a Jew." And then after the confession, the, the, so the priest runs out, you know, and he runs and he meets him, and you know, because they're in a box, so they can't see each other. And he tells him, "It's like if, as long as you say the Catholic, you're okay. You're, you're I take your patour. You don't have any acceptability. It's a great system. That's why it works for so many people. <laughs> no effort." Yeah. Very easy. Yeah. You can probably even send in an email nowadays. They probably have like a, yeah. a, a an email address. Just send in your sins and that's it. That's it. It's okay. No, no other work. So the the the, the, the priest tells him, "Oh, you reconsider." Doesn't want to hear about it. He started. He went to an old Jew in uh, in, in in Germany who started telling him, "Of course, we don't want converts. We don't want to start." He persisted, and eventually he started learning until he 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 became a Jew. He became a Ger, became a Jew. He moved to Israel. He saw that Germany was in his place. He moved to Israel. He cut off his father. He couldn't respect him anymore with his mother. He was still in connection to. He was still in connection with. And eventually he moved to Miami. Religious Jew now. He moved to Miami. And his children, he would never speak about his past. He was extremely ashamed from where he was from and what they are. But he, he, he just never wanted anything to do with his past. So his, he has this one son called Tal, and he, and his son, he told him, like, where from? So he told him, you know, your, your grandfather was a nut and everything. Yeah, so in their Miami play group, Jewish play group, so they go around the table, and they and they say okay, so they ask this little tell. So where where what are your grandparents? Where they do? Says my grandparent is a Nazi. Oh. So the principal hears this and he calls up uh, this uh, doctor, Doctor Burns, and he says, 
there are issues at home that your your son doesn't get along your your son doesn't get along with his grandparents. He's calling his grandparents the Nazis, and so he says, "No, it's actually the truth." I'm like they were, so they thought it was just like this. The grandson was insulting his uh, his grandparents, you know, something like they didn't give him his birthday present or something. He says, "No," and he explained to him for the first time the story. The principal told him, you have to share this story with everyone. This story, from then on, he started talking about it. I think this is very recent, by the way. He started talking about his story and and about about his past, and he feels that this is what gave him, it's giving him his uh, therapy, his, his minuhata nefesh, that he's able to share the story, like he's coming able to, to close, to close the, the circle. And he says that what drove him was the fact that he sees that the Jewish people just keep on going. We, we, we did it. We're special people. And we have in us the drive. Some will kill us. Some won't. So what? Next. That's, you know, this is the most extreme. You can't get more extreme than this. But it's true even in this regard. So all the more so when we have our personal challenges, when we have personal tragedies, there are, there are so many terrible, terrible tragedies. And one positive thing I want to tell you, because I also want to dedicate the shoot for the rifwa of two little boys. One of them is called Rifal Yitzchak Isaac Ben Michal, and the other one is Chaim Michael Shalomo Ben Michal. And both of these boys lost their sisters last week in Eretz Israel in Jerusalem, and there was apartments where, unfortunately, there was some mess up with the extermination. Yeah. The exterminator came to, to get rid of, um, to, to, to get rid of, I don't know if it was moths or something, and there was a phosphorus that was in the air, and that phosphorus, there was no, there was no care, and the young girls, four years old and, and, and one years old, weren't able to, their body wasn't able to, to take this, and they died, the little, the girls. No, no, they took them to the doctor. They, they, they didn't, they didn't, in, they didn't swallow anything. They didn't swallow any poison. It was in the air somehow. It was in the air somehow, and some major mess up. Some major mess up. It was, it was a horrible situation. And, and he said, God give me. And God, and God take it. Even the grandmother. Now, could you imagine? Could you imagine? How this, these two boys were in critical condition last yeah. week. In every single yeshiva in Eretz Israel, over here, we, we really prayed very hard. Thousands of Sifre Torah were finished. Lirifua of these little boys. And I just got news today that they're doing much better. The doctors in Petah Tikva Hospital are calling it a miracle. They're calling it a miracle. The power of Tefillah. These parents, instead of wallowing in their in their in their in their sorrow, they picked up and they told they, they yeah, said on the radio, they said, "Please pray for our children. This phosphate doesn't have any antidote. It's that's it. It's in the body." Doctor said, "There's nothing we could do. No antibiotic. No anti-poison. Nothing. It was all in the hands of Tefillos. And Baruch Hashem, these two boys are doing much better." The very, and they're already looking and asking where their sisters are, and this is it's, it's a it, it's a horrible horrible situation. But when we are faced with challenges like this, we we have to remember that we have in us a mishkan, and we have a lot of light. And lo alenu, sometimes there could be darkness and destruction in there. We have to know how to focus on the light and to say, okay, we have challenges. We, we can't let the challenges pull us down. We have to keep on moving forward no matter what. There is no option. There is no option of staying down. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help anything. We just have to keep on moving and moving and moving. Because that is our legacy. That is our history. If we think about this is what this Dr. Burns said he saw in the Jews. That's what Prime Minister Harper said about the Jews. And we know this better than anyone. That this is our koach. We are persistent people. We are people that have a, a future, and, and, and we, 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 we persisted it. So you need that son, that these worlds, once again, will be the Nishmat, and we should only hear good news. Amen. Can you that son?